Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Uh, we continue talking about um, what's inside the atom, um, more precisely what's inside the nucleus. So the previous lecture was talking about protons and neutrons, and we continue this um, particular topic, and today we will talk about isotopes. Now, isotopes are basically different uh, atoms which are the same in something and different in something else. Um, now, what's the same? The same is um, electrical characteristics of the atom, which means number of electrons and number of protons. So, two different isotopes of the same element have exactly the same number of protons and electrons. But the number of neutrons inside the nucleus might be different. And that's what actually differentiates one isotope from another. Different number of neutrons. Protons and electrons are the same numbers. Now this lecture is part of the course called Physics for Teens on Unizor.com. It's presented. There is absolutely no um, financial strings attached. The site is totally free no advertisement. You don't even have to sign in if you don't want to. Um, I do suggest you to watch this lecture from the website because it's a course, because it has menus, it has certain um, uh, dependency between the lectures, and there is a, some logical sequence of lectures, because I'm using in a subsequent lecture whatever I was talking about before, obviously. Um, the website contains a prerequisite course called Math for Teens. So whether you took that course or you just know all the material, it's necessary to know your math before you study physics. Also, um, many um, exams uh, are there. You can take them as many times as you want. Uh, also, every lecture has a textual supplement, which basically like a textbook. So you can watch the lecture or you can read the text for that particular lecture with some maybe pictures or whatever, whenever it's required. So I do suggest you to watch the lecture from the website and use the functionality of the website, which obviously includes menus and um, exams. Okay, so back to isotopes. Different isotopes of the same element have the same number of protons, which is Z, its atomic number. Remember, number of protons, which is equal to number of electrons, is called atomic number of the element. Atomic number of hydrogen is 1, atomic number of helium is 2, etc. Now, so Z is atomic number, and it's the same, it's number of protons, different isotopes. N is number of neutrons in the nucleus, and that is different in different isotopes. So the same element, let's say hydrogen, it might have one uh, proton and no neutrons. That's a regular uh, hydrogen, which occurs everywhere. Now, the uh, isotope can have one, still one proton, and one neutron. That's called deuterium. And the third isotope known to physics is, again, is the same one proton and two neutrons. That's called tritium. So. These are different isotopes of hydrogen. One is the regular one, and two others are isotopes, so-called. Um, now, the chemical characteristics of, ele uh, of element are based on electrical kind of qualities, right? Number of electrons, because it's electrons which are actually involved in chemical compositions to create a molecule, let's say. So if you have 
if you remember, we were talking about uh, sodium plus chlorine. It gives you sodium chlorine, which is regular table of salt, right? So these are reactions among upper lever, uh, upper layers of uh, of electrons, the shells and subshells, which are on the outer outskirts of the atom. So, number of neutrons, in theory, should not really affect the chemical composition. Well, at least almost. I mean, to re we can say right now, at least on the level which we are um, trying to understand what this is all about, we can say that the number of neutrons is not really affecting the chemical um, bonding between different elements. However, the physical characteristics might be quite different, and that's very important. Now, how do we identify isotopes in the books or when we are talking about? Well, we are identifying them by atomic mass. So number of, elect uh, of electrons or protons plus number of neutrons is called atomic mass atomic mass. So atomic mass of regular hydrogen is one. Atomic mass of deuterium, which has one neutron and one proton, is two. And atomic mass of tritium is three, because it has one proton and two neutrons. Okay. So how do we do it? Well, again, by specifying atomic mass. And here are examples. Carbon, in most cases, the most frequently occurring kind of carbon, has six protons and six neutrons, which makes um, its symbol C6 and 12. So six protons and 12 is atomic mass, because it has 6 neutrons. 6 plus 6 equals 12. Now, we usually put it as carbon 12, specifying mass here. So in the textual description, when we are saying carbon 12, carbon means it has 6 protons. And 12 means that the atomic mass is 12, which means it has 6 uh, neutrons. Now, we do have carbon-13 and carbon-14, so this would be C613 and would be C614. So this one has, so in, in, in all cases, Z is equal to 6, N is equal to 6, uh, Z is equal to 6, N is equal to 7, and z is equal to 6, n is equal to 8. We get to 14 mass, right? So that's how we identify different isotopes if we, if, if we think it's important for the context of something. Similarly, <coughs> we have uranium 235, and we have uranium 238, two major um, isotopes of uranium. So this would be U92238, and this would be U92235. Um, so 92 protons are in uranium no matter what, because it's a uranium, and the number of neutrons in this case is what? 143 n is equal to 143 and in this case n is equal to 146 different number of neutrons okay so this is all about how we identify the different isotopes okay fine next <coughs> as we're saying while chemical properties might be the same in different isotopes, physical might be different. And one of the most important 
physical characteristic which is different in different isotopes is that some isotopes are stable like this one this is the stable carbon that's what we see everywhere now the this carbon which has eight neutrons this atom is not stable it decays and sometimes the uh, decaying is very slow like for example in this particular case um, certain mass of this particular um, isotopes of, of, of carbon decays in half which means it actually diminishes in 57, 30 years now there are some um, isotopes which have half-life which means they are diminishing in half basically um, in millions of years and there are some which are dissipating in milliseconds so it all depends but in any case this is one of the very important um, difference between different isotopes so the number of neutrons affect the effect of the affects the decaying of the atom but probably every atom is decaying in some way or another I don't know but those which we kind of consider as non-decaying are very very stable like this one like this one and those which we definitely know we can measure actually that in certain amount of time the amount of that particular element which we are dealing with decreases by by 50 percent <coughs> now um, what's important is that the neutrons are actually acting as stabilizing factor for the nucleus of the atom why well look electrons are surrounding the nucleus on a re relatively to the atom size to the nucleus size on a relatively long distance and they're keeping and new, the nucleus is keeping electrons on their orbit um, well using the electrostatic forces protons are positive electrons are negative and there is an attraction so electrons are um, I don't know, flying you can say at least right now uh, around the, the atom on certain orbits and they are kept on the orbit by attraction of the protons and not flying away well in metals for instance upper electrons can actually go away but that's okay I mean we're not talking about particularities we're talking about principle now so unlike charges plus and minus positive and negative attract like charges repel each other that's why on the same orbit we cannot have too many electrons they will repel each other and push outside but at the same time we're talking about nucleus where the protons which are all positively charged are together so what keeps them from actually flying apart and destroying the whole matter well there are some other forces in nature not only electrostatic, not only magnetic forces, there are other forces, not only gravitational forces, right? So the, the forces which are keeping the nucleus together are called nuclear or strong forces. Now the strong forces exist between two protons, between protons and neutrons, and between neutrons and neutrons. So all the combinations of particles inside the nucleus are attracted to each other by these strong nuclear forces they are acting only in a very short distance and they are not really affecting electrons or anything else 
but on a short distance they are strong enough to overcome repelling force of protons among themselves. What's also important that the number of neutrons is usually greater or equal to the number of protons. Why? Because if you have a proton and proton and proton and proton, it's nice to have a neutron in between to basically separate protons from each other. So in three-dimensional world where you have protons and neutrons somewhere near each other, this particular inequality assures that protons are not too close to each other. So there are some neutrons in between protons. And that's what kind of helps the, to, to keep the nucleus together. Um, because electrostatic forces still exist, so we do not have to, you know, put protons near each other. So it was really very smartly designed. This world was designed by somebody, a very smart guy. And, um, okay, so that's very uh, kind of a natural consequence. But it doesn't mean that it's always um, better to have more neutrons than um, than protons, um, because like in this particular case, uh, this is not stable as much as this one. We have two more neutrons, but that seems to be like extra. These extra neutrons are not really necessary to keep six neutrons is sufficient to keep the carbon nucle nucleus together. So eight is too much, and that's why we have this kind of decaying and we will talk about the king. So, that's, again, that's kind of an inequality between uh, protons and, and neutrons. Okay, and um, now I would like to really talk about one particular application of our knowledge about isotopes. Now, this particular application relates to something which is called Radioactive dating. Now, dating in terms of determining the date, or age, rather. It's not like meeting man and a woman. Um, okay, so I'm sure many of you heard about carbon method of identifying or determining the age of something like a bone from uh, some kind of a animal who, who lived millions of years ago, right? Well, not that far, but something like 60,000 years ago, yes, it can be actually determined using this particular method. So, it's based on carbon not just regular carbon, but the carbon which is this one, which has a known decaying property and known measured decaying property, like half-life is, as I was saying, 57, 30 years. 57, 30 years. Half-life. Okay, so how this particular thing is done. Well, let's consider in the environment you have certain amount of this particular kind of isotopes, isotope of carbon. Let's just put aside how it's occurring in this environment. So most of our uh, carbon is normal, which is this one. Six protons, six neutrons, but there is some percentage. Let's consider it's permanent percentage of uh, uh, carbon with uh, atomic mass 14, carbon 14, in, in the nature. 
Now, chemically, this carbon is, is exactly the same as this one. So, we are consuming, we, I mean, we living beings, which means animals, people, trees, all plants, etc. They're all consuming carbon because carbon is part of the inner structure of the blocks from which we are all made. Now, um, so we are consuming this from the, uh, from the surrounding environment, which means it's kind of coming into our inner construction, inner atoms, which we, which we, are consist, which we consist of, molecules, whatever. Now, the problem is, it decays. But since we, since we live, we are breathing, we are, we are acting, or the tree has uh, whatever the manifestation of the life in trees, it grows, etc. So we are always consuming from the surrounding environment carbon, which includes certain percentage of carbon-14, which probably means that inside of our bodies, inside of animals, inside of trees, etc., the amount of carbon-14s, like a percentage to other kind of car car carbon, is more or less the same as in the, in the surrounding nature. Because we are, we are living, we are constantly consuming something. So even if it's really decaying, we are compensating. Okay, now, as soon as something stops living, like animal dies or tree dies or something like this, it stops consuming this uh, carbon from the outside. The regular carbon stays as it was because it's not really decaying, at least not noticeably. But this one is noticeably de decaying. And by examining by how much percentage of this carbon relative to this is in the uh, dead tree, for example, which we have found, we can really measure how much time um, went by since this particular tree has died. Because the carbon-14 is not replenished. And it decays. So this is the whole story. Now let's talk about the details of this. First of all, where the carbon-14 comes from. Okay. Here is the story. <coughs> you have basically cosmic radiation which bombards the Earth's atmosphere all the time. And it's uh, relatively high energy, um, ultra short electromagnetic waves. You can call them gamma rays, something like this. Now, these are electromagnetic oscillations of a very, very high frequency, and that's why very, very high energy. Remember, the quantum of energy is H Planck constant times frequency. We did talk about this. Now, what this high energy electromagnetic oscillations do? Well, they bombard the atoms, and in this particular case, there is an atom of nitrogen. It has seven uh, protons and seven uh, neutrons, which makes its atomic mass 14. Now, what happens with this? Well, the cosmic radiation bombards the atoms which are in the, our, our, our upper layers of atmosphere and they basically destroy these atoms. They break them apart. So whenever the atom is broken apart by cosmic radiation, well, there are some protons and neutrons fly and electrons are flying around. So some neutrons attack or hit um, the atom of nitrogen. Now, the neutron has atomic mass 1 and no electric um, charge, right? So it's 0, 1. 
Okay, so what happens here? Well, what happens is whenever the neutron hits the atom of nitrogen, which has seven protons and fourteen and, and seven neutrons, what happens is it kicks off a proton and electron. Proton has charge one and mass one. And what happens? and places itself instead of this proton. So, so what happens? Now instead of seven protons, we have replaced a proton with a neutron, so it's six. But the atomic mass is exactly the same. Because we are replacing proton with a neutron, the atomic mass is the same. And that's why what we have here is six. 14. And this thing combines together into H11, which is hydrogen molecule. One proton and one el electron um, combined together, and that's what happens. So whenever a neutron hits nitrogen, we have created the nitrogen. Uh, uh, hydrogen molecule, uh, uh, atom, and um, and atom of uh, carbon-14. That's the source of carbon-14 in our atmosphere. So it's all from all these cosmic radiation which um, break the atoms of the upper atmosphere, producing a lot of particles, among them neutrons, free neutrons, which hitting the nitrogen produce hydrogen and carbon-14. That's the source of carbon-14. And again, carbon-14 is decaying, carbon-14 is um, created by this bombarding from the gamma rays from the cosmic radiation, so it exists in our environment. And let's just assume that we know how much, what's the percentage of this carbon-14 relative to the more common regular carbon-15. Okay, fine. So that's one thing. That's how um, carbon-14 carbon is created. Now, it's consumed by living organisms, and inside these organisms, approximately it's... Um, concentration is the same as in our nature, more or less. Okay, then the organism dies. It does not really replenish carbon-14 from the environment and carbon-14 decaying. So, what happens next? What is decaying, basically? Decaying means the following. We have this we have this carbon-14 and what happens is <coughs> one of these extra nucleus which it has, uh, extra neutrons in, in, in the nucleus which, which it has is basically converted it, it, it's not really needed to keep the uh, nucleus together, so it um, it goes through transformation, and it's difficult to explain right now about the details of this transformation, but it can be transformed into proton and electron and something else, because neutron is neutral and it has uh, the uh, atomic mass one, proton has atomic mass 1, but it's positively. But then if there is an electron, it neutralizes the electric charge, and proton plus electron becomes neutral again. So basically what happens is one of the uh, neutrons is converted into uh, proton and electron. So when it's converted into proton, 
it becomes nitrogen because if neutron is converted into proton it increases the atomic number but atomic mass remains the same from neutron to proton it's the same one electron goes out and there are some other things which happening here well I can tell you that it, it, it's called electron antineutrino and some energy is released I mean these are really a, a complicated byproducts of this decaying but, but, but my point is that this particular carbon-14 is converted into um, uh, nitrogen back into a regu uh, regular nitrogen um, and that's what decaying is all about and then there is something released as well as I was saying so this is the decaying process so this is how carbon-14 um, is created and this is how it disappears and it disappears with certain speed now let's talk about speed now what does it mean that half-life is 57 30 years it means that if you have certain amount of um, carbon-14 let's call it one one of something doesn't matter whether in uh, in 57 30 years it will be only one half of it. that's what half-life means so in one in two terms of 57 30 it will be half of half which is one quarter in three one more 57 30 years it will be one eighth right you see the idea if y is equal to x times 57 30 years go by it will be 1 divided to 2 to the power of x 3 to the power of 3 2 to the power of 2 x to the power of x so if you have determined that you have that many concentration that that much concentration of carbon 14 in in the dead tree it means it was x times 57 30 years passed since it died so let's just do it slightly different arithmetic if you determine that your concentration is n times less than normal then n is equal to 2 to the power x x is equal to log n to the base of 2 and y which is the period is equal to 57 30 times log n base 2 so this is the formula <coughs> as soon as you know that okay the concentration is one hundredths of original concentration assuming you know the original concentration then you put one hundred here to this formula two to the power whatever it's like uh, what uh, seven approximately so it would be seven times whatever about forty thousand years okay so one hundredths concentration of carbon uh, 14 in the dead tree means it died about 40,000 years ago so this is the basis for radioactive dating of certain things and there are obviously limitations approximations etc etc we are not talking about the details of this methodology my point is to talk about nucleus and transformation of nucleus when carbon 14 is created and then decaying as an example of the inner structure of the nucleus and how protons and neutrons and electrons are interacting with each other okay so I suggest you to read the textual part of this lecture it's on physics14 course of unisor.com 
uh, you go to um, part called atoms. In the atoms, you have um, sub uh, sub menu called um, mm, how is it called? Um, I think it's called nucleus and electrons, and then you have uh, this part, which is called this lecture, which is called isotopes. That's it for today. Thank you very much, and good luck.